What is going on YouTube? Today we are looking at Dagger Heart, which is from the guys over at Critical Role, done by Darrington Press. The 1.5 uh, beta, I suppose, open beta, open beta, uh, just came out, and we are going to take a look at it. We have, I have looked at the da Dagger Heart before, uh, previously, but that was when it first came out, uh, and I just got a general gist for the idea of how to play the game. This time we're going to go through it and sort of uh, critique a little bit more. TLDR for this is it's kind of long, three, four pages of notes for the TLDR. But so the basic premise of this game is you roll 2d12 and you add a bunch of different modifiers and stuff called hope to it to give you extra bonuses. Your result is the result as a number, but you, from the 2d12, you have a hope dice and a fear dice. Whichever one is higher will add an extra effect to whatever you're doing. So if you roll high, if you roll past the DC of the check with hope, you gain a hope counter, which lets you can have up to six of these, and then it lets you like add a d6 to something, I think, or add a hope. I can't remember if hope's a d6 or not, but anyway. And uh, if you uh, roll, if your fear dice, your fear d12 rolls higher, then the DM or the GM rather gets a fear counter, and they can use this later in lots of different ways. Uh, but you might still succeed. Now you can fail with hope and still get a hope. You can fail with fear and, and the DM will still get a fear. If you roll doubles, it's a crit and you auto succeed. All right, let's run through this document. It is quite long, but we will try and skip through as much of it as we possibly, possibly can. Uh, so 2d12, designated hope and fear, a d20 and more dice for damage. Hope and fear, whichever number is higher, has a benefit or a detriment. GM uh, gains counters when the players roll with fear and the players gain counters when they roll with hope. Uh, it is great in this book that there is a golden rule section. Here we go, right here, the golden rule, which basically states that if you, uh, you don't agree with something, just play it however you want, which is amazing. It's amazing for a game to just say this. Uh, I think it's great. Player principles is a lovely little section that, to remind the players to have fun. So all these player principles here, this whole section, it basically tells you how to play a role-playing game uh, with your character. Be a fan of your character, actually like your character, spotlight your allies, great idea, uh, play to find out what happens, address characters and address your players, hold on gently. So, you know, improv improvisation is, is, isn't always perfect, so just, you know, do what you can and build the world together. These are great tips, absolutely amazing. Uh, then we have explain the character creation section is good and it mentions the players should think of an idea for character before picking the class and other things, right? So I think that's a great idea. This whole idea of figuring out how to create your character really comes down to a concept and you should have a concept for your character. So don't feel like you need to uh, pick a class first or pick a background first or oh, it's called something different here or, or like pick an ancestry first or whatever it is create your concept first and then try and fit that into something and the good part about it is the classes in this are like briefly described right here on this in this document you know like it says like for example a bard a word you could be a wordsmith or a troubadour so play a wordsmith if you want to use clever wordplay and captivate crowds or play a troubadour if you want to play music and bolster your allies so it's got like brief examples of how each class plays with just a simple sentence or two which could really kind of provide inspiration for which class you might want to pick your ancestry the only thing that i am a little bit like this document is a little bit jumbly right that's another problem i have with this document is there's a lot of like jump to this section if you want to learn this jump to this session if you want to learn this it's not laid out very succinctly uh, which is a bit unfortunate but so my problem with ancestors is you do have to jump ahead to a different section but there is lots of nice art there for an idea generation as well as the abilities that they have for each of the ancestries that you gain from a certain ancestry are all pretty easy to understand and they're really cool they're really thematic and i like them a lot uh, so after you choose your class and then you choose your heritage, you choose your community. And there's lots of different communities and the community is, it's essentially representing your background and where they came from, but it also gives you some mechanical benefits to your character. But one really cool thing that I like about this community is because it's sort of limited in a sense, 
it means that it's really easy to link characters together from what kind of community they came from um which i think is really dope because you can then like later tie your character with other characters really easily six stats you got agility strength finesse instinct presence and knowledge and again when these are explained they all have very obvious benefits to them and it tells you things like agility sprint leap maneuver strength lift smash grapple so it gives you examples of how these stats interact in the game are also simple stat modifiers so instead of having a stat score and then you have a modifier as well everything's just modifiers so it's plus two plus one plus one zero zero minus one for the starting stats that's your that's your stat array at the start of the game and it's it's just easy to understand it's really really easy then the next part that goes into in character creation is talking about evasion hp and stress so evasion is essentially your armor class like in fifth edition whereas this is the number that the enemy has to beat to hit you but that depends on your class it depends on what armor you're wearing it depends on a bunch of different things and then the actual your hp score and your stress points also are de determined by sort of a variety of things uh your heritage your class and uh and stuff like that how much damage you take pretty different in this game so your hp might feel really really low you might only have like five six hit points but that's fine because the way you take damage is completely different uh, to DD and completely different to a lot of games to be honest so there is more on this later again the layout of this is kind of annoying but there's more on this later uh rather than it being right here and it tell you how your points works it's like skip ahead to this chapter and then figure it out it's kind of apparently awesome you got to jump around so much and then come back again and then jump around again and come back again so anyway it explains hope and fear here a hope and fear is a neat way to navigate the story hope means you can add dice uh, and bonuses to gain rolls to situations. You can have a maximum of six hope at any one time. Make sure you use them frequently because you can only get six at a time. And you gain hope from a bunch of different things. You gain hope just from rolling the dice most of the time. So there's that. And then fear means you might succeed at a cost or the GM adds a token to their pool to use against you later in the game in some capacity. That's basically hope and fear. It explains it right there and there. It explains it like three more times later in the book <laughs> in a little bit more detail. But yeah, anyway. Okay, next, choose your starting equipment. So, weapons and armor seem simple enough. Weapons deal a certain type of damage dice, uh, which is, you know, uh, the same for most TTRPGs. And armor can reduce the damage by a flat amount depending on what armor you're wearing. You gain starting equipment from your class. That's pretty obvious. But you gain, like, extra stuff from your class as well, right? And you also gain these basic essential items. Uh, then you can create a background. So, creating your background is kind of like a prompt sort of thing. So, you can fill out the prompt that's in the in the character background section which isn't here by the way that's later again um but you can feel out the prompt section try and figure out what your background is either stick with the prompt or you can make it up as best you feel now you can choose experiences as well these experiences are sort of like one word things that you can try and invoke anytime you have something that's related or might be applicable to that experience that you've got uh, this seems a little vague and you might not ever use it because you might not always think it makes sense but that's fine because a lot of the examples that you can look at and pick from assassin blacksmith bodyguard bounty hunter or characteristics like hardened observant survivor skills like barterer uh, fast learner liar like these kinds of things you can use those simple phrases to add a bonus to specific roles that you might make throughout the campaign or throughout the games next domain cards so choosing domain cards so the domain system is essentially where your characters get a lot of their abilities from not all of them but like 90 percent of them there's a huge list of cards but essentially it gives you different abilities that you can use they have different costs different stress costs that's for martial abilities and for spell casting abilities it's for everything uh, in the game which i think is kind of a cool idea that there's like a deck of cards that you can like shuffle through and look through they're all determined like which ones you can use is based on what your character class is but there are ways to access others through multi-classing and through other certain abilities that you might be able to take or use so you gain more of these as you level up of course and then uh, you can mix and match between the different domains that you get access to for your class which means you can kind of lean into one thematic uh, type of character or another 
if that's how you prefer to play the class. But then we have creating connections. So connections, you create these connections to other players. I've wrote down here that this being the last thing you do during character creation might not be the best order to do this in because sometimes it's easier, much easier in fact, to think about this stuff while you're choosing a community or an ancestry or even the class that you choose related to which domains you have access to that you might be able to create some kind of connection with another character in, or characters in the party, right? So putting this at the end is like i guess but you should maybe i mean you've already done the thing where you've asked us to jump around so many times in this document that maybe mentioning it earlier on that maybe when you pick this thing you might want to think about what other players are picking so you can create uh, connections with that player later on in the campaign or later on in the character creation process uh having example character sheet filled out is really really is a great and simple way to see exactly what to do when the process is a little bit more complicated like this right when you have to jump around a little bit and players are not quite sure and it is a new system so it's a really really great idea to have that there i think it's absolutely fantastic uh, i like the idea of domains as themes for each class right so you get two domains per class gives your class super cool theme and then it allows that flexibility uh, and it also allows some spillover for ideas from class identity that makes it a little bit more flexible. Depending on which class you get, you get access to different domains. It really allows you class identity. And it means that two players can play the same class and them still be fairly different, uh, depending on what abilities you pick for your domain cards, which I think is really cool. There are the list of classes after this, and I will not be going through all these because classes are classes and they've got a bunch of unique abilities and there's a bunch of stuff and there's not much really, there's not much point in really going through all these classes. So I am gonna skip ahead. So adjusting abilities and spells, there is a section on this, which is amazingly inclusive, right? This is an awesome idea to provide options for people who want to represent themselves in the game that might be uh, less enabled. Uh, and also it allows for really interesting roleplay options as well, right? You can put yourself in the shoes of another. Maybe you're blind, maybe you're mute, maybe you've, you're deaf, maybe you're, you know, you don't have, you've got prosthetic limbs, like all this sort of stuff. The, the ability to adjust spells and the way material components and mechanics work in the game simply based off your own physiology or your own mental aptitude like it's fantastic i think that's really cool it's really inclusive it's really good it's absolutely awesome to see this in a game okay next we're into playing the game there is a nice little intro uh, an example on how to play and narrate a ttrpg now the core mechanics of this game unfortunately unfortunately i say because i don't agree with this but there is no initiative order sort of in this game there is a action tracker and an action tracker essentially doesn't even explain it straight away you've got to like again you've got to skip ahead like two chapters to figure out what this thing is but basically players take turns say what they want to do and then that that when they, when they all have like a certain amount of goes then the the GM either steps in by using like fear counters or like something and takes his own turns. It's like all the players go, then the GM goes, then all the players go, then, all, then the GM goes. But the more fear the players roll, the more turns the GM gets or the GM can like interrupt the players as they're doing stuff with fear tokens and stuff like that. So that's kind of how the turn order works. I don't like it at all. I like the idea of like one player goes, one enemy goes, one player goes, one enemy goes. I don't like the idea of all the players go, all the enemies go, all the players go, all the enemies go. And depending on if the players roll really badly, then the enemies might interrupt them. Like it would really honestly take some getting used to. And I think it would really mean that like while the players can just do as much as they want and then the enemies get to react as much as they did, it just means that players could just keep going until <laughs> till all our enemies are dead before the, play, before the GM gets to do anything a lot of the time that's what it feels like it might happen it's a little bit odd I don't really like it that much okay next moves versus actions it seems a little bit arbitrary you can move and then maybe nothing can happen or you can move and then you might have to move you know an extra distance but moving that extra distance requires a roll but the roll doesn't mean it's an action even though it says when you have to roll something it typically becomes an action it just seems like why not have you can move an arbitrary distance because all the distances in this game are very arbitrary uh you also have uh the ability to do an action i don't like that they try and explain the action track and other things here but they don't go into detail uh, and keep saying explain later in chapter x i literally wrote this point down i shouldn't have to jump around the book to understand the game mechanics explain them in order it's that easy 
just explain them in order right especially since this is the play test manuscript this should be made for the gm to run and all the stuff the players need to know should be in a separate document or in like another section entirely just explain them in order okay then it's got something about making rolling doubles which is a crit that's fine i think that's cool i don't know what the percentage is on 2d12s to roll double i'm assuming it's the same as rolling a double on another dice where it's like a five percent chance right on a d20 to roll a crit but anyway it might be higher than that which is cool uh using hope and fear is explained again here i mentioned this earlier but yeah it's, it's explained again uh, i suppose it's in a little bit more detail but has already been mentioned before this uh twice i think uh evasion is a large explanation is like this whole paragraph right here it basically just means explain how you don't or do get hit <laughs> like it can be summarized into exactly that okay hit points and damage thresholds this is a complicated system but it is interesting uh, and it's different and i actually kind of like it to be honest i actually kind of like this idea but it might require some more nuance to it i'm not 100 percent sure right so you can only ever lose between one and three hp per attack that is against you right like per hit now you don't start out with that much hit points you only start out with like six hit points or something like that you can gain more as you level up and you gain some more in other ways but basically uh, different classes have different thresholds of damage uh, and when you take a certain amount of damage it goes over a threshold now if it meets the threshold um or is over it you take that much damage right so if it's a minor damage that is lower than so the example here is eight hit points for a major damage threshold and 16 hit points for the severe damage threshold, right? So if you take eight points of damage from an attack, it's a major damage attack and you take two hit, you mark off two hit points. If it's less than eight, so if it's seven down to all the way down to one, you take one hit point of damage. So you only mark off one hit point. If it's 16 or higher, you take off three hit points, right? And now you can reduce this by using your armor. So if you've got armor that reduces it below that threshold. So if your armor was say four and you and you took like 17 damage, you could you could then reduce, you could use one of your armor charges or slots or whatever they're called, and then uh, reduce the damage by four, which would bring it down to the major damage threshold. So you'd only take two HP instead of three, but in, in replace of using one armor. Um, so you've really got to kind of like strategically determine how much damage you're taking and whether or not using armor is actually going to put you below a threshold. Now, I think... I'm not entirely sure, but I think you can use armor more than once on one attack and actually I don't think you can. I don't think you can reduce it more than once per armor. That didn't I didn't actually see that anywhere, funnily enough. But we'll think about that later. Maybe you can. But at a simple glance, uh, this might slow down combat a little. And I, I I think like once you're used to it, it's probably fine. And but it seems like this is very mathy. This is a very mathy part of the game that you have to kind of like get used to and be very, it's very nuanced, right? Like you might want to take this damage at one point so that later you can reduce it with armor so that you don't take as much damage later in the fight and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, there are also things called stress points uh, and you mark down these when you use abilities and there are other effects that might cause you stress, but uh, stress points are sort of like a... A point system that let you where you use your abilities or where you where you get affected by some kind of condition or something like that now there are also action roles a lot of steps to this which is fine how the gameplay works sometimes and there's a lot of things to consider there's a lot of things to add you add hope you add experience you add blah 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 like there's lots of different things to add to these different action roles but essentially there's four things you need to consider whenever you roll pick a character trait you add extra modifiers you roll the dice and then you resolve the solution there's extra stuff that you can add to it so extra stuff that you can add to it is like do i have an experience do i have a hope dice do i have some other like thing that i can add to it so there's like a few different things you need to consider seems like it might just take a little bit of time but again that's just part of the system and getting used to playing the game probably works out completely fine i don't think it's that big of an issue there are tokens and dice tokens are made to make the game seem like less mathy even though i just mentioned the fact that you have to figure out this whole mathy situation with your armor and your stress and your hp and whether or not you reduce it below a certain threshold and yeah so anyway uh tokens are apparently there to make it less mathy but you've got just as much math in the hp system and in the combat system already so it doesn't really matter uh there are lots of examples of outcomes in battle on a critical success on a success with hope on a success with fear on a fail with hope on a fail with fear basically it just shows you like how to play the game a lot like a lot of explanations on how to play the game 
calculating damage, damage resistance, all this stuff is, if you know 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, which a lot of the people watching Critical Role obviously do, because they play 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, and you probably got inspired to play Dungeons and Dragons because of Critical Role, so you probably learned 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, which means you're also aware of all these different concepts that are basically exactly the same there is direct damage direct damage basically means just straight damage you can't reduce it in any way i've got a point here that i that i'm writing that i guess the one good thing about no initiative is that you can do more combo like abilities which is mentioned in like the group actions and like team tag team roles and stuff like that which i think is pretty interesting yeah that's that's pretty much the only good thing that comes out of that but you could just delay delay your turn in initiative order to do that stuff anyway so, uh, advantage and disadvantage in this game are not the same. You don't re-roll the dice. It's you add a d6 or you subtract a d6 to your fate roll. Next section here uh, talks about the domain cards and a loadout and a vault. So there's two different kind of things. Uh, a vault you have is the abilities you know. They're, these are the abilities you learn when you like pick the class and level up and all that sort of stuff. And loadout is the ones that you like have ready to use. So you can only pick a certain amount of cards from your domain that you can actually use from your loadout, right? can swap these cards out by spending stress points with certain classes and certain abilities but there are other, also other ways to kind of like swap these in and out during the day when you have a rest blah 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 like this there's there's a, it's kind of an interesting idea that you basically have these things that you know but you didn't like prepare to use them but you can swap them out for an extra cost and actually still be able to use them which i think is really cool i think it's a good idea then we're then we're on to the ranges system um yeah, there's there's things like conditions and stuff in here and countdowns, but I didn't... Countdowns, again, come later, so I'll talk about them later, but they are mentioned here. So just another thing that is mentioned briefly and then skipped over and then told to go to a different chapter. So at the start of it, it mentions that it doesn't use feet, but then it quickly switches to using feet in measurements later, like very quickly, just to make it a little bit clearer. But it's essentially, there is melee range, there's very close range, there's close range, there's far, there's very far, and then there's out of range. And these are defined in distances of squares of one, three, 6, 12, and 13 plus squares on a grid. Uh, they are also later, again, explained as like predetermined amounts of uh, feet, which I thought was very funny. But anyway, uh, these ranges regarding movement makes it seem more complicated because it'll either be part of an action that you're taking or, or that you're about to perform will require a skill roll to perform the movement part of that action. Although it doesn't really require an action, technically. Now, that sounds really complicated, though, what I just said. I don't know if it even made any sense, to be honest. Basically, movement is you can move close-ish distance. And then if you need to move further, you roll a skill roll. And if you pass it, you move fine. If you fail it, you don't move as far. So you have to try and move again. It's not really that clear. Like, anyway, gold. Getting on a golden loot, all right? Gold is measured completely arbitrarily as well. It's measured in handfuls, bags, and chests of a ratio of like 10 to 1 of the lower to the higher. It means you don't have to sweat the small stuff like paying for food and blah, blah, blah. But it seems a bit like when buying larger items, which again, in this book, it tells you to skip later ahead and try and look at the equipment section. And it doesn't give you a list of prices for anything. It tells you to make them up yourself, which I think is a little bit slack. But basically it's like, yeah, no, we don't want to deal with like economy in this gold is gold is a great reward to give to your players and then they just have as much as they have and they can do whatever they want with it and then you can determine whether or not they can afford stuff on your own judgment i suppose uh which means there's no real way to like barter or you know convince shopkeepers to give you a different uh, price because there's no exact amounts of gold that you have so it seems a little bit odd but i guess they just don't really care about this so much in this game which is fine i think that's fine too if you don't want to care about gold economy that's completely fine but there are a lot of people that will have to then homebrew a system to be able to fit into this game which i guess they can just steal from any other games it doesn't really matter anyway resting you choose two things from a list of things that you want to do when you rest i think this is a cool idea so for example on a short rest uh, you can pick two of these things you can tend to wounds you can clear some stress you can repair armor or you can prepare so these are the four things that you can pick from pick two of them to do on a short rest on a long rest there's a like an extra thing you can tend to all your wounds clear all your stresses repair all your armor prepare or work on a project 
So essentially, you could do more of the same things that you can do in a short rest, but they just have a more dramatic effect. And you're gonna still only pick two of these that you wanna do in a long rest. I actually kinda like it. It's pretty interesting. It gives resting not just, I get everything back and I can just chill and not have to do anything. It's actually like, no, what do you want to do on this rest, right? I actually think that's pretty inter an interesting and interactive idea to affect rests. And also downtime allows the GM to do things like gain power from the, for the enemies. And this is a good idea to balance just how much the party will rest by them knowing that the more that the party rests, the more power gain-ish, I suppose, the enemy will probably gain, right? Because the enemy has, and they explain this later, again, it sucks that I have to keep referring to the fact that they explain this later, but there are what's called countdowns. Countdowns essentially are like a list of things that will happen in a certain order. In between the next 24 hours, these things will happen. It doesn't have to be 24 hours, arbitrary amount of time, right? But zero to 10. So it's zero to 10 things that might happen. On a zero, this is what's happening right now. On a one, this is what'll happen next. On two, that'll happen after that. On three, that'll happen after that. And it's usually the big bad evil guy's plans. Um, and so if they rest, then they skip over the fact that number four, the big bad evil guy's caravan is moving across the plains right now. And they can't stop it. They can't stop him from traveling across those plains because they're resting. They're sitting around doing nothing. Well, not nothing, but you know what I mean? So they can't interact with what he's doing at that point in time and that's sort of how the, these countdowns work and that's sort of how they interact with rests in a system where your story has periods of you can take a rest whenever you want but if you do there's consequences for taking a rest at this point in the story so i think that's actually kind of interesting too i like that a lot and it's something that i might try and implement in my own games fifth edition dungeons and dragons next character deaths there are death moves i think this is kind of cool there's three different ways you can deal with this one is is a blaze of glory so you can take an action which automatic which is an automatic critical success and then you die right so you can do something crazy uh really really big automatically succeeds but you die you can avoid death where uh, roll your hope die and if it's equal to or under your level uh, you gain a scar you drop unconscious and basically you can't do anything but you can be resuscitated essentially uh and then in doing so you take a scar now a scar is basically you remove one of your hope die options so right now you've got six hope die maximum but as soon as you take a scar from like you fell unconscious and were on the veil of death you can only ever have five maximum hope now and then four and then three and then two and then one and as soon as you have the ability to have no hope you're dead so you just straight up die so it's like six chances essentially for you to avoid death but you know that's a fair amount uh and then risk it all so you can roll your dice you can clear the amount of hit points and stress equal to the value of your hope dice if your hope is higher but if your fear is higher you die and if you roll doubles if you crit when you risk it all you literally regain like all of your hit points and all of your stress it's kind of crazy it's actually insane, which is massive. So you can risk it all to either roll a crit and go back to full, roll a hope, get up, stay, keep going, or roll a fear and just straight up die. So those are the three different kinds of actions you can take upon death, which I think is really cool. Now, the action tracker is finally explained here. It's a bit complicated, so you kind of have to look at this picture where they show you. It also is like what counts as an action, so it's not completely clear what counts as an action every single time, and then goes back and forth between PC actions and the enemy actions, depending on how many actions the PCs get. So you can sort of use an initiative where you want, where the PCs have like maybe three actions maximum that they can take before they have to wait for everybody else to have their turn and then you can finally have the, uh, the enemy's turn, but you can sort of interrupt it with fear dice and stuff like that. Next, there are four tiers of play. Tier one is literally level one, that's it. Tier two is levels two to four, tier three is levels five to seven, and tier four is levels eight to 10. There's only 10 levels in this game, which I think is fine. I think 10 levels is more than enough. There's a lot of games now that are kind of simplifying that because in Dungeons and Dragons, you almost never get to 20th level. You almost always ended up like level 10, 11, 12, maybe by the time the campaign ends. Anyway, uh, you gain some basic things from being able to level up, which is nice. You just, not everything is based around your class or whatever. So that's kind of cool. But when you level up, you choose how you level up certain parts of your character. It's not everything. You don't gain HP, you don't gain proficiency, you don't gain blah blah blah. You don't gain everything when you level up. You choose which couple of specific things you level up, which is okay. But if you're like me and you've got ADHD and you second guess everything that you do, which I guess is anxiety as well, you're immediately going to regret the fact that you made a decision. 
no matter what that decision is. Only being able to pick a couple of things out of a handful of things really sucks uh, for people like me and probably for a lot of people that want to create like super epic characters uh, or super like specific characters. And you pick something and you realize like, ah, I'm not actually, uh, this actually wasn't the best option. Maybe I should have picked this. I guess it's discussing with your DM to then say like, can I change this back to something else when I leveled up at level two or three or whatever? Uh, and then them saying like, okay, which I think is usually fine. But uh, yeah, you can immediately regret your decision, essentially. You know, you never financially recover from it. Next, you can't multi-class until level five. So the game is basically halfway over. I say it's halfway over, but it's halfway, like you're halfway in the game, right? So not being able to multi-class until level five. And you can only multi-class once ever, which is fine. I mean, look, it's okay that you can multi-class into one other class and that's it. That's perfectly fine. But sometimes it does kind of limit the you know, sort of flavor you might have for your character, which does suck. A little bit which is actually not a big deal to me because i don't really like multi-classing at all anyway i don't like multi-classing in D, D because i feel like you miss out on power increments when you do multi-class so that's just okay by me next weapons and equipment equipment section looks fine it's pretty stock standard pretty obvious there's a bunch of abilities on each weapon and equipment which is kind of interesting and cool you know they've got like different properties to them and features to them and stuff like that which is really interesting there's a whole humongous list of stuff there is also a list of loot uh, and depending on what loot you get whether it's common uncommon rare or legendary you roll more dice to determine like what the loot is so you could end up you could still end up getting some common loot especially if you roll low on the dice for the loot table but it is a very long loot table running the adventure there are loads of tips and tricks in this section for being a GM and there's also an explainer on how to use fear and tracking it and gaining it and all that sort of stuff so you're just supposed to like just keep count it seems pretty easy spend it to interrupt players you spend fear to make an action of some kind or use some kind of feature or use some kind of environmental thing to do something there's more info on the action tracker again in this section which again I think is kind of like you know it's interesting that again they're, they're like talking about the same thing again they should have just explained everything about in one section rather than in two or three different sections there is a dc examples page which gives you the dc examples for a bunch of different things that you might want to do so pretty obvious but like you know it's got example example difficulty of something like climbing five really slow is just scale ladder 10 scale a stone castle wall or moderate incline 15 scale a stone castle wall with rain or sharp mountain slope a 20 scale a siege tower during a battle clamber up a massive foe 25 scale a sheer cliff in like you know it scales pretty infinitesimally but i feel like five scaling a high ladder that shouldn't even be a roll people can climb a ladder it's not hard to climb a ladder if it's a high ladder it's not hard right you shouldn't this shouldn't be the dc shouldn't start at five if it's very easy they shouldn't be able to fail like just skip that but the rest of the, it's you know when you look at stuff like that's at like 15 or 20 it gives you a good idea of the increments that this kind of stuff becomes really different it's got really good examples for a bunch of different things so especially for something like hide i think it's a really good scripter of how like hiding works in a sense for what the dc might be if you don't want to get if you don't want to get seen the game likes using countdowns as a way of providing pressure for players to act this is okay if you want your enemy to be doing things in the background and you need your players to be aware of things that might happen while they're resting or uh taking an adventure okay so here we go i've got a point here that says it's okay to have these kind of countdowns if you want your enemies to be doing things in the background and you need your players to be aware of things that are happening while they're resting or adventuring elsewhere but you don't always want to mention what the enemy is doing in the background, right? You don't really want to mention that a lot of the time. But the player should probably be aware that something is probably likely to be happening. Uh, next, my next bullet point for running the adventure section is maybe this book has too much in the way of teaching you the philosophy of how to play, right? There's a lot of different stuff in here that is like laying the groundwork and se session zero and safety tools and like the cat's method, which is concept, aim, tone, subject, like... Like these kinds of things are good to know, but you don't need to put them in your game rules book. You know what I mean? Like, and if you did, these should be in a section that is right at the start to explain how to play TTRPGs or in an appendix at the back somewhere out of the way where players can read them in their own time, not in the sort of middle of this book. Well, I mean, I guess it's not the middle. Well, it is kind of the middle. It's like 180 out of 400 pages. So, you know, 
Uh, next, adversaries and environments. Stat blocks for NPCs and enemies look pretty simple. Look pretty interesting and pretty simple. Some HP, a HP tracker, stress tracker, what kind of stuff they can do, their like how difficult they are, what kind of damage they do, what features they have that they can use, special interesting abilities. It's got some moves and tactics and stuff there. Pretty basic, pretty easy. They have types of enemies here, which is actually really cool. I like this a lot. Like bruiser, hoarder, leader, minion, range, skulk, social, solo, standard support. Like this is a really cool section and an interesting way to quickly determine what kind of enemy it is. And I actually like this a lot. I actually think this is really, really cool. They also have experiences, which can make them like unique, right? All of your enemies can be unique if you give them an extra experience. Like the one they've got up here is, it's got experience of being a bandit, plus two. So anything that's involved with being a bandit, they get plus two to when they roll. But you could make these experiences like really specific to that character as well, which is kind of interesting. And they could, th you could theme a character around something like that. Environments having actions, I think is a really cool idea. It's basically like layer actions, but it's for the environment in itself. So it could be a storm, which means you could have lightning happening and blah, blah, blah. I think that's really cool. And there's also a bunch of stuff about setting uh, and location in this book too. So you, you scroll through all this creating your world. The creating your world session has the Wither Wild, and then it's got all this stuff about the Wither Wild, and it's got all these different factions, it's got all these different information. So it's basically got a setting guide in the back of this book, which is really cool. It also has an example on how to homebrew for this game at the end of this book as well, which is phenomenal. I'm providing notes to GMs on specific guidelines, I suppose, or like really good ways to think about how to homebrew for this, this game specifically is incredibly good it's incredibly incredibly good it means that they know that their players are going to homebrew which a lot of games don't take into consideration they just assume that they know everything or that they've planned for everything or they think that they've got everything written down that's it that's the end of the review uh my overall takeaway is i think there might be too much information for new gms about how to run a game uh, and how to narrate a story uh and what kind of methods they should use i think it's a little bit just a little bit too much i also think the document itself is scattered i think that it needs to be better laid out i know it's only a beta you know it is what it is my biggest example is it mentions hope and fear in like three or four different places it mentions uh trackers in a couple of different like cool like count countdowns and counters and counting trackers and action and the action tracker in like two or three different places without fully explaining it in one place all the class stuff is pretty succinct except for ancestries you have to kind of jump ahead to the ancestry and community sections to figure out what mechanical benefits they give you um, but for the most part uh, they are all in one section uh, the domain cards are like a separate document but i think that's okay because the cards themselves have very like that you very specifically need to look through those individually to see what you want to pick. So I think that's okay. I wish it would explain things as it mentions them rather than mentioning it and then telling you to jump ahead to a certain chapter to look into it more. And then it mentioning it again, again, after that <laughs> as well to try and explain it again in a certain situation. I think it's got like a decent example of um, stuff but i think it, its examples might be a little bit too long-winded like it doesn't need to be you don't need to have an entire scene laid out you just need to have specific things laid out that are difficult to perhaps uh, understand it does do a really good job of it with the character sheet uh just having examples of pictures of the character sheet pictures of the action, action tracker so you can pick that up very easily if you look at those images and be like oh, okay this makes sense and it does make sense but it doesn't immediately make sense when you read it because the first time you see it it doesn't explain it all. So that's the only that's the only gripes I kind of have with Daggerheart. And that is the end of my playtest. Thank you very, very much. Remember, if you did enjoy this review, don't forget you can follow me along on all socials at Critical Mits. You can also hit that like and subscribe button because that's free. You can do that. Boop. That would be awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, and also become a supporter on Patreon for free. You can join as a free member on my Patreon where you get a bunch of cool stuff each month. So I got uh, maps, magical items and monsters coming out as well as a blog post that explains how to be a better DM and do a bunch of cool stuff at Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, thanks. We'll catch you next time.